I'm speaking to you from uh, the book of John, and I have one main, main sentence. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Will you go with me to John chapter 2? In the title also given on the, I think, in the week bulletin, it talks about deception by missing the small things that God has for our lives. When we look at the whole concept of end time, when we look at the concept of so many more deception that were coming to the world, more confusion, more theologies and theories and conspiracy theories and whatever you want to call it, there will be a key also in the simplistic way that God wants to speak to you, but sometimes where it's really irrational and where you can really miss it if you don't understand how to hear him. This is about Jesus changing the water into, into wine. Now, from verse 3. When the wine was gone, Jesus' Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. My brother, my sister, you can come with your, with a crisis management to Jesus. You can come and you must come with your situation with, to Jesus Christ about everything. But this wonderful, encouraging answer, Woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> what a reply. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Who would like such an answer? You're in a situation and uh, you need certain breakthroughs and God's telling you, why do you involve me in this? Hello? I want you to, to go and ask God, God, what are you saying to me in this season? When, when, when you would ask me why I want you to be involved, help me to understand my motive. I want you to be involved, Lord, so that I can give all the answers. I want you to be involved so that I can get all the breakthroughs. Why do you want God to be involved with your life? Why must God get involved with your finances? Why must God get involved with your relationships? Why must God get involved with your job? Why? Now, this awesome response from the mother. His mother said to the servants, what, Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. My brother, my sister, when you get an answer from God, when you bring your situation before him, and first of all, God says, why do you involve me? And secondly, he says, my hour has not yet come. That's time to get discouraged. That's time to get a, what's say, look of up in English, a holy, whoop. yeah, tantra, a holy tantra. You know, because, thank you, Lord, I came with my crisis, I came with my challenge, I came with you, but I put it before you, and you ask me, why must I get involved? My hour has not yet come. Jesus didn't say, Mother, woman, don't stress, don't fear. I promise you, there will be wine. Just give me a chance. That's what we want to hear. Hello. <laughs> and after Jesus would give us such a promise, with that promises, we will go to the seven and say, do whatever he tells you. Not because you have a bad motive. Just... Do whatever he tells you, because we're standing on the promises of God. God said, I will make sure that there is wine. He didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. What he said actually implicate even more that it's not his problem. He's not necessarily going to do anything about it. But you can believe me. He said, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. And based on that type of response, there's one sentence. Do whatever he tells you. 
And if you can get that right, my brother, my sister, in your life, if we can get that right, that if we understand or not understand, not only when we understand the promises, or not only when we understand, yes, this is what God wants to do, I'm trusting Him that He will do it. No. But I will say, God, even if I feel you are saying to me, you're not going to help me at all, even still then, I will say, I will do whatever He tells me. And we need to be a Mary in one another's lives. That when your brother and your sister don't understand what God is doing, do whatever he tells you. Say that to your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband. Do whatever he tells you. Now it's easy for us to read the Bible because we know at the end of every story. So when you know the end of every story, it's very easy. You know? Do whatever he tells you. Why? Because we know he's gonna, the world's going to become white. They didn't know that. The only thing that the mother had to go on was God says, why must I get involved? This, my hour has not yet come. That's all. May God help you. May God help me. That we will have the wisdom not to fight the process. But it's when we get answers like that, that we deceive ourselves and where we allow ourselves to be deceived and get into things. I don't understand what God is saying. So we are doing nothing. We are just sitting with the issue of water and wine. No wine. There's no wine. We sit with the thing. We bring it before the Lord. Oh, we spend time with the Lord all the time. And we have the scripture and we have this and we have that. But we know we need to find an answer. How are we going to get wine? We bring this before the Lord. Meanwhile, we are deceiving ourselves. Because most probably, maybe three, four, five times, God already spoke. But I need to understand how to interpret what God is saying correctly. And that oh, my obedience is not conditional. I will obey God when I understand. But the problem is we don't know that God spoke already. <laughs> we will not be deceived in the future anymore in Jesus' name. Because we will grow up. Amen. The more mature you become, the less you understand. The mature has the guts to do what God says when he does not understand. The immature, insecure, must first understand everything before I will do what God is saying. But God's going to raise up His church to become more mature. That we will just do whatever He asks. Do whatever He tells you. Verse 6. Nearby stood six stone water jars. Stone water jars. The kind used... By the Jews for ceremonial washing. Everybody say ceremonial washing. So, we have a crisis, uh, crisis management. There's no time for wara wara. There's no time for thinking about this or that. We need wine. Jesus, first of all, why do you involve me? Secondly, my time has not yet come. Thirdly, he's talking about uh, these ceremonial washing jars that's not time to focus on the ceremonial washing jars just live yourself into the story it's not story clickety click it is reality and so many times in, and with this situation God is asking me this freaky questions with all respect and then he starts to talk about do something with these other jars where we must wash our hands with it. We don't have a problem with the washing of hands, God. We have a problem with the wine. And so God will speak to you about that because He's setting you up. The devil is waiting for you to fail. And in the name of frustration, He can just dump more demons of frustration and negativity and discouragement and all that other stuff is on you. He's preparing for a landing, the devil. To land there on you. More depression, more negativity, more frustration, more this, more confusion. You don't know what God is saying. Uh, it, it does not really work. Just calm down. Don't, don't get too psyched up. He's ready, but God is ready for a miracle. If you will have the guts to obey Him in simple, freaky commands, if I can say it like that. So. What does it say there? 
Um, ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Okay, good. Verse 7. Jesus said to the seven, fill the jars with water. Fill the jars with water. This is getting even more ridiculous. Please don't look at the end of the story. Our, our problem is we look first at the end of the story. Then we cannot see the reality of, of what they went through and how God challenged them in the process. So because it's in the process that we are challenged. And then we don't see the miracles of God because we don't understand the process. We don't realize there's a process where God is challenging you. Because he wants to have the glory. He wants to be, be in the center of it. With your wine problem. That sounds bad. Okay. No, you have a problem that you don't have enough wine. No, no. You understand what I'm saying. Okay, but what that wine problem? And you can be so focused. And now all this other stuff you must do. It's not in line with what you prayed. It's not in line with the calling. It's not in line with your focus. It's not in line with the crisis. It's not in any way making any logical sense of what you're doing now. The washing jars, fill it up with water. First, it's for the washing. Secondly, we've washed already everybody. We washed our hands and everything. Thirdly, it is water. Our problem is not water. Our problem is wine. Three, four, five, six, seven things totally out of line. Okay. So when after we filled that, the jars with water, they filled it. Then he told him, now draw some out and take it to the master. To the master. Everybody say the master. The master of the banquet. Jesus wants to make a fool out of you. What the heck? Now I take the washing bowls, I fill it up with water, and now I must take this water and take it to the master, to the boss of this whole ceremony. He didn't say, don't stress, you will see. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to change the water into wine. Just look at me. Wow, Lord, standing with you. Yes, yes, yes. And with excitement, I take the, the wine to the master. No, 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 no. He didn't say that. Will you honor him? Or will you deceive yourself out of every miracle, out of every experience, out of every breakthrough? So many that God wants to. Not everyone, sorry. You will see breakthroughs. We will see miracles in a lot of ways. But there's so much more that God has for you. <sighs> if you and I have the guts to obey that small insignificant commands that look, look so illogical, e e irrational, not in line with our situation. No, I'm too busy. I cannot focus. I can only focus on one thing. God and I are focusing uh, on one thing now. I cannot multitask. I need an answer about the wine. I cannot multitask and now worry about the ceremonial washing and if there is water and if there is enough water and if that is full. And the most freakiest thing is to go and give that water to the master. We need to give him wine. Hey, Amen. And so we can get stuck in that frustrating Christian lifestyle. Till you die. A very frustrating Christian lifestyle. To figure out all the things we had to do, but we, there's the breakthrough, but if we could do, do whatever he tells you. Say that. Do whatever he tells you. Okay, let's say that once. Do whatever he tells you. Mary, with no confirmation that God's going to do anything. That just go encourage the guys around. You go encourage the people around you that don't have a cooking clue what God is going to do. And just tell them, do whatever he tells you. Amen. Speak it to your own troubled soul. In the past. Not troubled anymore in Jesus' name. And everybody know the rest. It was the wine. Hallelujah. May God help you. That you are prepared to make a fool out of yourself. And to draw the water from the washing 
bucket, whatever you want to call it, from that place and to go and give it to the master of the whole event. Hmm. May God challenge you and may we have the grace to obey him. Grace to obey. You know this one guy? Uh, maybe some of you guys know the story. Long, long, very go, long ago. Um, this guy, he was very into evangelism. He did a lot of evangelism on the street and everything. And God one day just told him, scream it out. Jesus loves you. Who knows that story? One, two, three, four, five, seven. Okay. Long ago. And he screamed it out. Jesus loves you. And he ran into a, bull, a shop. And he said, oh, Lord, I don't know why you will do this. This is, not, this is not the way. And after he sorted this thing out with God, that we're going to now do this in a more behaving way, you know? He went out, and as soon as he went out, God said to him, scream it out again. And he screamed it out, Jesus loves you. And many moons later, months, I don't know how long, in a church service, there was this guy who gave a testimony. He said, I was standing on the top of the building, and I wanted to commit suicide. And I said, God, last chance, if you are real, speak to me. <laughs> and the next moment, you hear this voice screaming from the air, God loves you. And he stood back, he was so shocked, and he testified about this. True story. Testified, about it. And, he said, and he said, God, if this is really you, say it again. Come on, my brother, my sister, are you willing to be made a fool according to your perspective and allow God to use you? Make sure that you don't become so, with that freaky word, professional. It has a root that you only can say yes, you must walk in excellence because you do as if unto the Lord. That's the only context where professional is correct. You must be professional in what you do. Why? Because what you're talking actually about is I can be trusted, I walk with integrity, in character, with faithfulness, and I will do this as if unto the Lord. Not perfect, because you're a human being. But that is, any, that is the biggest definition that you can give to your professional life. Okay, are you with me? Are you still here? Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, next one. Will you give me a drink? That was not to the bartender. This was Jesus to the lady at the well. Will you give me a drink? Come on, guys. Jesus didn't need the drink. When the, when the disciples came back and, and they said, did you have some food to eat? I mean, he replied, said, I have food that you don't know of. My food is to do the will of the Father. So did he really need the drink? God will ask you stuff that he does not need. But he will ask you some stuff so that he can, re can reveal himself to you. Are you with me? You have that nice bicycle. God says, I'll go and give it to that person. That person does not need it, Lord. Can you not see? <laughs> with all respect. And you just do what God is telling you. Please. Have the guts to do what he says. Can, you, can, can, we, can we go with that one? So he asked her to do something that is not right. That is not right. So immediately she's on that wagon and says, How can you as a Jew ask me as a Samaritan? You as a man, me as a woman, you as a Jew, me as a Samaritan, to ask to give you a drink. God will challenge your mindset. And he's not interested in the drink. He's interested in challenging your mindset. So we will give you that stupid command, that thing that you must do, so that in that, this mindset can be challenged with this command that he gives you. Give me a drink. But he's addressing this thing in that lady's life. Are you with me? Don't be deceived and miss that, those commands, those things. Give me a drink. And in the end, this lady, she had her men. Yeah, well, we'll get to that later. But I want you to give me a drink, but I'm going to give you a revelation of the fountain of living water. 
You do what God tells you, you will be amazed, amazed at how he will reveal himself in your obedience. She could have said in a very professional way, in a very rational way, with everybody agreeing with her, Jew and Samaritan, everybody to agree with her. I hear what you ask, Master. I'm, I'm very sorry. I respect our culture and your culture. I respect you. And me as a Samaritan woman, uh, I will go and fetch somebody to come and bring you a drink. Awesome. 10 out of 10. But that is not what was expected. When God would ask you to do something, it does not fall in line with your culture and your way of upbringing with your good manners. With God will not do you to do something that is freaky bad. That's not what I'm saying, but you understand. No, but she stayed in the conversation. She stayed in the conversation. Stay in the conversation with God. Stay in the conversation with God. How can you, she could say, I'm sorry, this is not right. Uh, forgive me, forgive me, but I cannot give you a drink. I respect you as a Jew. Perfect professional response. Perfect. Get involved, get involved. Jesus said, must I get involved? This lady decided, I will get involved in this conversation. He asked of me a drink. How can you ask me this? No, I will give you this. But this and this and this. But this and this. And in the conversation, you stay in conversation with God. And God gave this woman this mighty revelation that he didn't even give, give, give one of his apostles. One of his disciples didn't receive that. But this woman received the revelation about praise and worship. You will not worship on that mountain, but you will worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And my Father is seeking those who will worship Him in such a way. Awesome, intimate revelation to a lady where He even asked her next one. Go, call your husband and come back. Ha! Huh. God will ask you questions to nail you and to shame you. Oh, this is shaming the lady. He knows. Oh, man, come on. God knows that this, this lady, she went through some guys. There's six. Now why would you, why would that brother, that sister, come to you and just expose that thing in your life? Because he wants to shame you. No. Because God has sent him for you to have an encounter with God. To show you that this six men that you tried in your life, they are not the answer. The seventh man, Jesus Christ, he's the answer. So that brother, that sister, that leader, that child leader, you might better get those people in your life that will come and, and expose that thing in you. Expose that thing in you so that you can finish off with the six men and go to the man, the man in your life, Jesus Christ, the seventh man, for a breakthrough. <sighs> but for that, he comes and he asks you that question. Where is your husband? As if Jesus, once again, does not know. He knows. Okay. So allow God in these small things, and you will be, you are destined for breakthrough, destined for revelation, destined for intimate relation, destined for uh, a dream that Father has in his heart for you to go and live it out. But don't be deceived and rob yourself because you're not willing to obey Stupid, small demands, commands, demands for things that you don't understand. You don't understand. We need to grow up to simply obey. Tell your neighbor, grow up so that you can obey. Okay. Right, next one. Go. Tell your neighbor, go. John 4, verse 50. Maybe I must just give that to you. So what is the question? The man come. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him. Begged him to come. Begged him to come. Everybody begged to come. The strategy, the logical strategy of what he saw, what he heard, the testimonies, Jesus, point one, come. Point two, Heal. I beg you. I plead with you. I pray. Come and heal. 
his son, who was close to death. Verse 49, the royal officer said again, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus do exactly the opposite. Why? 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 Why must it be? Afrikaans is aspres. What's Engels? On purpose. Like, you know, you say, please, Lord, come. Jesus says, go. I'm not coming with. You asked me to come. First time. Second time, please come. Jesus said, I'm not coming. Lord, you did it for all the others. Uh, what about me? My son is near death. My son is dying. Please come. Jesus says, go. <laughs> I'm not coming. And if we hear that in our mind, maybe we think it's the devil. You take that thought into captivity in the name of Jesus, you know. We are focusing once again. I'm trusting the Lord to come, to come, to come, to come. I'm trusting the Lord in my prayer is my strategy for God. I have faith in the strategy that I give God. And the strategy is, you need to come. I have confirmation. I saw that. I heard that. I saw the testimony about you, how you came and you healed them. How you came and you raised them from the dead. How you came and you drove out the devils. So based on that, my prayer is the strategy. Instead of my prayer, my desire, but I surrender it to God with thanksgiving. Are you with me? Are you with me? So my God must help us that we will not give God the strategy. Please come, please come. And he says, go. Your son will be healed. Now that's a new one. Lord, that's a new one. But he decided. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. Part of his 50. The man took Jesus at his word. The man had no confirmation about past experiences where Jesus did it this way. But he decided, I will take him at his word. I will take him at his word, even though it does not make sense. And the big step for you is not to stay with Jesus in prayer and in faithful prayer and faith and pleading with him in intercession that he will come, that he will come, that he will come, that he will come. And there's the next of your 10 years in prayer before the Lord. But 10 years ago, God actually told you to go because the miracle is already there. But in the name of religion, let's stay in prayer before the Lord. So we can deceive ourselves. Wow, we need God's help with this man. This is not just clickety-click and we're out of this. But I'm challenged. God challenged me about this. <sighs> because more and more in the season coming in where heaven and earth will be shaken and the nations and everything, there's just that moment. It's just that moment. This man, is, it's just there. The crisis of the wine and the water, it's, it's now. This man's son is now he's going to die. It's a now. But with all these crisis managements of a now, something must happen. The most ridiculous commands. Totally out of line. Totally not in line with the problem. Or the thing, or the thing that we are focusing on now. Totally not in line with that. Ah, that is your God. <laughs> he wants the glory. He wants the honor. He wants you to brag about him and that others will look at your life and say, oh, could only have been God. I mean, they filled that with water, man. I saw it with my eyes. They filled it with water. And somewhere, maybe one guy had the guts to think, you know, those guys, they knew it was water. And they respected that Jesus so much. They respected him so much that they were prepared to fill those jars with water. They didn't, I saw, they didn't argue with him. They didn't argue with him. They didn't question him. They didn't wara, 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 this all with him. 
I saw those disciples. They just obeyed him, even though they, they saw it was just water. Amazing how those guys would just follow their master. All the glory to the Lord. But that's what they're supposed to say about you. They're supposed to stand amazed at how you are willing to be shamed and to be made a fool of in obeying him. Okay, we are still with one another. I believe so. Next one. Get up, pick up your mat and walk. <laughs> okay, very easy. You know the story. So we, we start at the end of the story. We know what's going to happen, man. He, God is healing this guy. No, 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 no. Get back to reality. Okay. Goeiemorgen, are you still here? Okay. So the situation is, here's this man, here's, here you are, you are sharing for the first time your, your everything, your frustration with this man. And he says, you know, there's no breakthrough because nobody wants to help me. Nobody is picking me up to be in time there for the, with the water. Everybody for themselves and to hell with the rest. Everybody is just doing their own thing. Everybody, you know, I share it with this, my brother and my, my sister and this Christian and that Christian and there that thing goes. Okay, and, but still, nobody helped me. Nobody helped me. I mean, this situation, because of the selfishness of all the other Christians. I'm here, and I've asked for help, and everybody can see I need help, but nobody will help me. Not one. Not one of them. Are you with me? Is he still here? Good morning. Okay, yeah, I'm still here. Okay. So, and after he shared the problem for how many, 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 many years why I'm still laying in this pathetic state here just next to your breakthrough. You are just there with your breakthrough. You are just so close, but nobody's going to help you to break through. Nobody. Then Jesus says, I'm also not going to help you to get in the water. The strategy is to get in the water, <laughs> and then you will be healed. Jesus says, I'm also not going to help you. Now, how does he say that? I mean, he doesn't say it like that. He says, stand up, pick up your mat and walk. I mean, God, so you so absolutely didn't listen to one sentence of what I said. I just explain now in so many words that I cannot walk. And because I cannot walk, because I cannot stand up, that's why I am not healed. And you totally ignore everything that I shared with you. And you just tell me to stand up. How insensitive can your brother, I'm not talking about Jesus, you know, when you, because you and me, we will just know when it's Jesus speaking. <laughs> no, this is your brother, your sister. You don't have energy. You don't have this. You are tired. You are fed up. You, can't, you cannot do anything. Give me space. But then through some other brother or sister, unfortunately not, not through the devil, um, you know, can you please do this or... Just do that, and you are expected to do something that is totally, rationally, absolutely, pathetically impossible. And when this guy don't sit there and argue with God, argue with Jesus, he didn't know it was God, that we can so rationalize our problems, our crisis, our challenge, our this, our that, rationalize it in such a way that we not go, oh, we go and I want to go and sin, I want to go in rebellion. Not that rubbish. I know, I want to be responsible. I have a brain. You have five brain, brain cells, yeah. <laughs> you have a brain with brain cells that work. And that brain cells clicking together, you know, they tell you it's impossible to stand up. You've seen that for 20 years. <sighs> that evening, he, with the friends that came and brought him some wine. Now, this is the bad wine now. And they got drunk. And then, he said, you know, they came with a guy today. And after all these years, the, the worst that I've seen today, 
there came a guy. I shared my everything with him. And that how nobody helps me. He look at me and he tells me, I'm going to stand up and walk away. You won't believe it. And they have a hell of a joke and a laugh that evening while everybody's drunk and think, where on earth will you get such a guy that will be so insensitive to come and tell a guy that's 20 years laying next to his breakthrough, stand up and walk away. Crazy. But my brother and my sister, our problem is so many times through small sentences, through that brother, that sister, that leader, Oh, that cellular, that kid, that child of you, that neighbor, that whoever, that one that irritates you. <sighs> it was actually God. And if you would have just obeyed him, if you would have stand up or tried to obey him, your life would have never, ever, ever been the same again. What if it is was God? What if that guy, what he asked you to do was God? What if it was God telling you to fill the washing jars with water when you had a challenge with wine? What if it was God? By God's grace, tomorrow is a new opportunity. We're going to grow up in Jesus' name. Amen. Next one. Where shall we buy bread? Okay, there's a crisis. Who is voicing the crisis? Who said that? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus wasn't in a Christ. I mean, he knew exactly what he was going to do. You know, even the, not the devil, but Jesus could stir you. He knows he doesn't want to do anything about this now, but he wants to expose their thinking. Expose their thinking. So he comes to you and says, oh, you have a crisis now. Where are we going to borrow some money? But he knows that he wants to supernaturally supply for you but he first come to you and say, okay, where are we going to borrow some money? <laughs> okay, and you can stand in with that conversation and just so focus on where and how. God said, God said we must buy some bread. That's a command. And you get stuck with that command in the name of performance with a demon of religion and all the laws. I must not be in trouble with my job. I'm in or out of trouble with my job. I must just do what I'm told to say. That's what a pathetic sentence and a laughing stock for the devil. Don't be a clown with the devil laugh at you when you do your job and say, I must just do what, what they told me to do, tell me to do, otherwise I'm going to be in trouble. Let the devils look at you, eat their popcorn and look at the comedy, your life. No, not anymore in Jesus' name. Not anymore in Jesus' name. So then, in that context, you will stay with this. In that context, you will kill Isaac. Because I don't want to be in trouble. God said, I must offer up Isaac as a burnt offering there. I must kill him and then I must burn him up, my son. And I will be faithful and I will do what is expected. And I go and I... Challenge myself beyond what I'm supposed to do, and I will be faithful. I will be faithful. I so focus in the name of performance, and I slaughter Isaac and I burn him up. <sighs> I did it for the Lord. I'm not in trouble anymore. That type of Christian you are, that you slaughter your own Isaacs that God has given you. Because in the name of performance, I don't want to be in trouble. <laughs> We're going to grow up in Jesus' name, especially in the end time. In the end time, there's no time to kill Isaac. That makes the father the murderer, not a worshiper. Obey God and stay in his presence, stay in his guidance. Then you're a worshiper going up the mountain, Abram offering up Isaac. But go in the name of performance in what you must do as a Christian. You're going up as a murderer, not as a worshiper. Where shall we buy bread? <laughs> this, is, this is a holy scaliness <laughs> with God. You know, he knows, he says, not, uh, they're not going to find it, they're not going to do it, but let's start there. Okay, next one. Have the people sit down. 
after what? After we realized, after we looked at the reality and we realized we have five loaves of bread and two fish. We, you've had 3,920 sermons about that. So after we know we have only, in reality, five loaves of bread and two fish. Okay, you must be the fool. You must be so stupid to tell more than 5,000 people, okay, let's go and sit in groups. Oh, well, why must we sit? To get 5,000 without a sound system to sit. Oh, man, oh, man. They had some miracles in those days. Okay, but get this 5,000 to sit in groups. Why? What, what now? Why, why? No, because we have five loaves of bread and two fish. We're going to eat now. <laughs> oh, come on. You don't have an answer. Jesus, uh, uh, with all respect, okay, we're going to let him sit in groups. Um, what's going to happen then? No, don't stress. You will see. I'm going to multiply the bread and the fish. Everything will work for the good, for those who love me. And uh, this is what I'm going to do. Thank you, Lord. I have peace in my heart. I go with faith, and I will obey, and I will tell him to sit because God is going to do a miracle. Not at all. Let us be deceived and not go with a stupid command. Or let's have the guts to be even become a fool, according to my brain, and do all these, some of these stupid things that God is saying. Let them sit. I don't know why, guys, Pete and Herman, that's not a Jewish name, and uh, whatever, Jaku, I come, I don't know why, but. The master said, sit. You go out there, and he said, I don't know why, but God said, sit. Have the people sit down. And that is the story of, could be the story of our lives, for until we die, to get all the people to sit and to calm down so that God can do a miracle. How many thoughts, how many emotions must go and sit in your life? But they are all over the place. The minds and, and the issues with somebody or the this or the challenges, they're so all over the place, they don't go and sit. Everybody say, sit! I'll tell you to a naughty dog. Oh, you can, you're afraid of the dog. Sit! Oh, let get the religion out. Say, sit! Don't say donkey. Guys, sometimes I hope in the name of Jesus, you will tell those emotions and thoughts and fights in your heart with people. And you tell them, I don't know if they said that, but uh, I want to say for that, you must say, shut up and sit. You know? Tell those things going on there. Shut up, sit. Why? You better sit. Because God is going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know how it's going to work. It's, it, I, I, I never heard about something like this. Because God never multiplied bread and fish. They caught a lot in the net, but I've never heard about any. I don't know what God is going to do. I don't understand. I don't understand. But set. Just that is the biggest miracle. Oh, no, in our days, maybe. Not in those days. For those 5,000 now, not to argue and what, 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 now what? Set. And then God did the. Impossible. He took the bread and he gave thanks. And I wondered if the guys looked at him, you know, or he was praying. Thank you, Lord, for the food. Oh. Didn't multiply them and said, thank you, Lord, that you multiplied the food and that now we can eat. No. Thank God for the food. My brother, my sister, in all your circumstances, thank God for the food. Thank God for the food when you have five loaves of bread and two fish and 5,000 people in front of you. Thank God for the food. Okay, next one. Let everyone without sin throw the first stone. Okay, you know about that. The lady caught in adultery. And she, the, the, the guys who knew, who knew the word of God, who knew the law, said, Jesus, the word says we must stone. What do you say? And Jesus will say, who's right, who's wrong? No. She was wrong. But they are also wrong. And everything must be interpreted in the context of grace and the blood of Christ. At the end of the day, where me and you stand. 
So you just throw down those stones. After that, I mean, Jesus knew they were gone, but Jesus asked her, um, where's your accusers? As if Jesus was confused. He wasn't confused. He wasn't confused. But she had to put it on her lips that the accuser is gone. God will ask you, where's your accuser? That you must put it on your lips and say, the accuser is gone. That demon of religion, demon of performance, all those devils that want to accuse me, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you for what you've done wrong. God says that accuser is gone. It's me in your midst. It's me giving you grace. It's me forgiving you. It's me telling you, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Let us walk this life together. God say today, let's walk this life together. I don't condemn you. I forgive you. But let's walk a new life together. Still here? Does it? Praise the Lord. Go wash yourself. Huh. That's about time, hey? Yeah. Daniel? Nee, nee, jij moet het voor iemand gaan zeggen. Ik zeg niet, jij moet jou was. Go wash yourself. Go wash yourself. I'm going to do this. I'm giving it away. I've given it away already in the first service also. But somebody must remind me. David, you better remind me. I'm going to do it one day. When you don't expect it. Because... No, I go by faith. I know you never uh, forget any sermon. But um, maybe in six months' time. So I'm going to get somebody out, call somebody out. I'm going to take some mud, uh, no, sorry, some ground. I'm going to spit on it. A lot of mucus. A lot of. The word says so. A lot of mucus until we become a clay, you know, mucus. And after, I'm going to take all that. I'm going to put it in your face. In your face. And then I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, go and wash. That's what Jesus did. I mean, Lord, could you just not have prayed like in a decent way, like with all the others, you know? Could you just pray, be healed. Be healed. Why you need to go and make a, with all respect, such a scene? <laughs> Hello? All those mucus. Everybody do this. <laughs> Your Lord and Master did it. Your Lord and Master did it. And he spit it out and he made clay. And he put it in somebody's face. Whew. That's the time to take offense. When your brother and sister in the name of the Lord. I don't recommend doing it just now. Just tomorrow in the name of the Lord. Unless the Holy Spirit really guided you. But. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> so, what. Oh, come on, man. Why did somebody do that tomorrow? You know? Somebody with a, with a spitting ministry. Okay. Um, yeah, we we'll do that. Oh, but you know, this is not physically just. But it's physical. This was really physical, I mean. And that after somebody would do that to you, you have been given a command. That's a moment that you have taken offense. You are belittled. He made a mockery of my weakness. He made a mockery of my weakness. Here I cannot see. I cannot see. And I cannot even see that somebody there is taking spit and may do it with spit. If he only could see that he's not even taking water. He doesn't have respect for me even just to take water. He took spit, man. Well, I couldn't see it. And put it and put it on my on my Making a clown of me. Making fun of me. I'm just getting back to reality of how people could see things. Because at that moment, we know the end of the story. Very nice the Christian story in the context of how we see it. They had no context. They had no context about this man. Well, you have the guts. Then after, when somebody took a lot of spit and mud and put it in your face... To obey him just immediately and say, go and wash yourself. Ha! That's a certain type of guy. That's a certain type of guy here that received this eyesight. You will receive some eyesight in this time. The body of Christ will receive some sight for those who have the guts. In order to think first about the image or to take insults or to... Or, uh, 
take offense about what this one did or that one did or that one did. Not to take the offense, but will allow some spit with mud in, on their eyes and in their face that when they go and wash through the blood of Christ themselves, they have an insight but they can see what they never saw before. That man could see what he never, 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 never could see before. You will see what you never, 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 never could see before if you have this type of capacity in your life of obedience. Next one. Take away the stone. Take away the stone. Take away the stone. Where, where, where is that now? Okay. Martha, Mary, Lazarus. Lazarus, Lazarus. God, you must come. Please, Lord, you must come. Please, Lord, you must come. And then he didn't come to his really one of his major good friends. Family of Mary and Martha who were so close, close to him. And he was so busy with the ministry that those who were so close to him, he will just forsook them. He just didn't think about them. Where some priorities about relationships? So busy with the ministry that he left one of his closest friends to die. Family of Mary and Martha that were so close, so close also to him. And gave up everything to walk with him. Didn't have the time. So when he came, Lord, if, if only, if he only, if he only came in time. Now he's dead, sorry. It's too late. It's too late. On purpose. It was too late. <laughs> Jesus did it on purpose. On purpose, he will frustrate you. On purpose, he will take you beyond his logic. The way your logical faith does not work anymore. In the future, more and more and more and more. Your logical faith, that can work in other times. Because it's not from the devil. It's not from the devil to be on time. Before Lazarus dies and pray for him. Hello? But Jesus, hey, he likes this type of thing. And in the end time, when everything is in a sudden, in a sudden, in a sudden, in a sudden, where there's a crisis, there's no, there's no bread for 5,000, there's no wine, there's this man that is dying, he's now dying, go, I'm not coming with, where this man, he, he's now dead. Okay, so it's too late. And so Martha the same. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection in the life. The lady says, yes, we know, Lord. We know, and we're going to see Lazarus. Yeah, for eternity. We're going to see Lazarus. We're going to be together. It's awesome. But that's not what he meant. Now, tomorrow, today, now, God wants to give you a certain breakthrough. And he said, open, open the stone. Take away the stone. Oh, Lord, he's, he's, a, he's a stench. The stench. The stench. It's not like, I mean, Jesus could have done, it could have come uh, after one day or two days after he died. No, he had to come after he, the corpse was already rotting. That means for something to stink, it means the meat started to froth, to rot. Are you with me? You understand? Anybody smell the rat in a roof? Nobody, only me. Yeah, or uh, something that died. We had it here in the church, a cat that died here in the back. It was an unchristian cat. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the first day I said, uh, David, I can't remember, I said, you better get the rat. I told guys, get the rat. And then Sunday, Peter Jones phoned and said, nobody's going to come to church. <laughs> it's, it's horrific. And then I got the photo of a dead cat here at the back. So, lay down her life. Um, bottom line. They used, I don't know how many spray bottles and, and, and perfume and everything. Nobody knew it when the people came to just, they smelled the aroma. That was all. Okay. But actually it was that cat. Now why did I tell this story now? Lazarus Young, man. <laughs> Now you think a cat must smell like that in such a big hall. A man by the fourth day. That means it's not 
I'm dead and life is coming back. That means flesh must be regenerated. What are you with me? That what already was frotting, rotting, had to the very creative miracle had to happen. But will you open up the tomb where you know that by fact, by fact, not by fear, but by fact, it's smelling. Will you open that rotten tombs in our lives, in our relationships, so that God can come in and do a major, major, major miracle. There where you with all respect say, God, this is done. This is forgotten. This is over. It's done with. It's, it's gone. God wants to bring to life that what you think is rotting behind the stone in your life. Allow him. If you will obey the stupid command of take away the stone. Take away the stone. Take away the stone. Let them sit. Bring the water. Do that. All of this stuff. Right through. Look through all these four Gospels. All this stuff. All these ridiculous commands. Next one. Who do you... You do not realize what I am doing. When Jesus went and he washed the feet of the disciples. You don't realize what I'm doing. But it's okay. Um, that's not encouraging for our mindsets. Because we normally... Yes, I know what God wants me to do, and I know why he's doing it. I want many times to see where he's going with me. I need to see where he's going. But the problem is, it's not that I allow him to take me there. I first need to understand before I will go there. May God help us uh, for the sake of time. I'm, I'm going. Woman, why are you crying? Woman, why are you crying? This is Jesus after he was raised from the dead. There's this woman crying. And God wants your attention, my brother, my sister. He wants your attention. So he will ask you, why are you crying? But he's, God isn't confused about why the lady is crying. He know she's missing him. She's thinking he's dead. But he is standing right in front of her. He could have just said, here I am. He didn't do that. <laughs> and even if she would think it's the gardener, he didn't walk away because she didn't respect him. She didn't hear his voice. She didn't recognize him. Praise God for his grace. That even when you think it's the gardener speaking, Jesus does not walk away because you took him for the gardener. Are you with me? But my brother and my sister, when you have relationship with God, when you have relationship with God, you know his name. And you know that he knows your name. So <clears throat> when Jesus said her name, he knew who was speaking. He knew. She knew, sorry. She knew who was speaking when he called her by name. She knew exactly, this is the master. Because she knew her name on the lips of the master. You need to know your name on the lips of your master. And then when he speaks to you, you'll know this is God. It's not the gardener. It's not the gardener. In the biggest turmoil at that moment of this lady, in the biggest turmoil, trauma and, and, and grief, Turmoil, trauma, grief. At that biggest moment of grief. When she heard the master calling her name, she knew who he was. She didn't say, he didn't say, I am Jesus, the Son of God. And I rose from the dead. From the dead. She, he said her name. And she recognized him when he said her name. Because there was a relationship. Oh man, may God help you, me, that we don't take him for a gardener and we are so in our turmoil, we are so in our turmoil here or stress or, or, or whatever we're going through that we are so in this, all that we hear is the gardener. But he is here standing next to us. 
And he's not the gardener speaking. speaking. He's your healer. He's your master. He's the one that gave himself for you. Amen. Last one. Oh, second last. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat. We spoke about this 300 times before. <sighs> okay, let's make it. You are fed up. You are tired. You've worked. You gave everything and nothing worked. You came home. You, had, you didn't have a bad day. You, you had the worst day ever. And All right, let's not say the worst day, the worst week or the worst year. But let's make it a day. And you are tired and Nothing happened the way you wanted it to happen. No breakthrough, no productivity, nothing went right, and you are tired. That's the moment when anybody can ask you something to do again. Hey. Okay. <laughs> That's the moment. Just give me space. Just give me space. Okay. okay. And then somebody tells you, no, go and do this again, but do it like this and give you, you the most pathetic strategy. He's tried to fish the whole night, and here this man comes and he says, um, all the fish are swimming on the right side of the boat. They, the fish don't swim on the left side of the boat. So just throw in the net on the other side, then you will catch fish. How ridiculous. Hey, it's not such a thing. But still, they did it. Still, they did it. And then the miracle happened. Jesus did not say, if you obey me and throw the nets on the other side of the boat, then I will provide for you and give you the fish. Just trust me. That's what we want to hear. That is what we want to hear. Hello? Only me. Okay. No, he didn't say that. He didn't even say it was Jesus. He didn't give a promise. He didn't tell them to have faith. He didn't give him anything of that. But we will miss out on so much that God actually has for us. Because maybe this is the man. And you need to ask, with that command, that sounds even ir totally irrational. Totally, totally irrational. Say, could this be the master? After the miracle, Peter just jumped in. He said, this is the master. This is the master. But before knowing that it's the master, now not out of fear I will do anything that I hear that is ridiculous. <laughs> Please not. <laughs> but you better ask yourself, could this be the master giving me this ridiculous command? Just say, could this be the master? Well, let's try that again. Could this be the master? That's if you want to see miracles. That's if you want to see breakthroughs. Not just for yourself, man. That fish was not for Peter. He couldn't eat a hundred fish. For so many others. For so many others. So many others you'll bring breakthroughs if you have the guts to ask, could this be the master? Because even if it cost me whatever, my image to look like a fool. Okay, let's throw in the net on the other side. And you catch nothing. That evening, what once again, we, with each one of these stories, we can carry on another 30 minutes with each of the stories. That night, you know, there was a guy. We catch the whole night. Have you ever heard about you or your friends or your parents or your grandparents or their parents or their parents and all the generations as fishermen? Uh, I heard a story about a guy coming and telling you, um, after all night, just throw your net on the other side and then you will catch fish. Ever heard such a story? No. What type of guy will come and say that to you? That is now if you did not do that. It would become a story, a joke. But when they did it because it was the master, there was not a joke going th through the generations. There was the praise of God, the honor of God, the glory of God. The testimony of God, what came through generations up till today. You with me? Throw your net on the right side of the boat. May God help you to follow his strategies. Hmm? There was another one still, but okay. Uh, the last one was, um, do you love me? 
Great. That's the last one. Do you love me? Oh, man. My brother, my sister, now we can say, well, God wants to know you. When you are at your lowest, hello. When you are at your lowest, you are down, you are there, you are at your lowest. And what happens? You're at your lowest. And you feel, I've done so many things wrong in my life. I've done so many things wrong. And I said, God, I will, I will die for you. And God says, before, you will deny me three times. And then exactly it happened. So I give up. So give up, I go do the fishing out there. And here Jesus comes and he questions me. And here I come before the Lord, and I know I'm not just in trouble. I've walked this, with this man so intimately, intimate, intimate relationship for three years. My master, my Lord, my everything for three years. He will build his church on the revelation living in me that he's the Christ. And I've denied him just like this. And here he come and questions me even about my love. So he, do you love me? So I most probably must say, Yes, God, I saw in what I've done that I actually don't love you at all. I realize. And you can hear the devil, but it's not the devil speaking. It's God reminding you about the gold inside of your spirit. But you just hear the, the devil thinking he's condemning you. Oh, so now you say you love him, but he, you denied him this other day. That's why, huh? Do you love him? No, you don't love him. You don't love him. It's cheap rubbish words. You don't love him. You just denied him this other day. But Jesus comes and he asks the same question. The same question. Not to condemn you, but to tell you what is it what that he has placed in your spirit, man. What did he put in your spirit? What did he put in your spirit? Are you with me? And he says, yes, Lord, I love you. And God says, then I trust you. When you can see the gold in you, then the Father can trust you. When you can see the excellence that he has placed in your spirit, then he can trust you. So the moment when he had, when Peter stood with the most shame that he could stand before God, with the most shame that he could stand before God before, because of denying Jesus, God says, there's truth in your spirit, therefore I trust you. Tend my lambs, tend my sheep, watch my sheep. I trust you, Peter. I trust you, Peter, because I know in your spirit is a love for me that you will be really willing to die for me. Therefore I trust you. So when God asks you questions, oh, be so, be so, be so aware. Be so aware that it's not to condemn you, but to show you the gold that he has placed in you. And that you will go with God, you will love him passionately, and do what you do because you love him. Okay? May God help us in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, thank you for your awesome grace. God, I pray that you will forgive us. Come and forgive us, Lord, for that what went wrong. For that what went wrong in our lives, Lord. And even now, as we will have communion, Lord, I pray that we will see and understand that what you have done in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for those small commands that many times that we we're supposed to understand how to, how to react, how to respond, but we thought it was a gardener. We thought it was ridiculous. We thought it was out of focus. Lord, but thank you for your, through your grace that for every man, every woman in this place, Lord, you still have breakthroughs for us. You still have awesome opportunities for miracles to be seen. Miracles not just of healing, but miracles for breakthroughs and relationships and Miracles in how you want to provide and, and surprise us, Lord. God, we, God, even now in communion, I pray that we will enter through the blood of the Lamb and know that there is forgiveness for every denying your presence, denying your input, denying that what you want to do. May that you come today and you restore. In Jesus' name, so we pray. Amen.